Now, one of the most difficult things we hear from new right ballast professionals is determining the dominant core region. There, <coughs> the latest findings are that you can play from any core region. However, if you can play from your dominant and everything fits, you'll be in great shape. There are a lot of different reasons you may want to understand what the dominant core region is. So let's take a quick look at just a couple of ways that you can uh, determine the core region. I have here on the floor <coughs> um, vinyl tape that has all nine core regions. Now I'm going to start, I generally start when I am looking at someone on the uh, very first number. So I put the middle of my left foot 90 degrees to the line, middle of my right foot on the first number here and stand tall and look straight ahead. Now, a couple of things you'll notice. It feels like my right shoulder is lower. You'll see that right away. Look at my left hand compared to my right. I'm just totally relaxed. As you look at this, one of the problems you're going to have with your students is they're not going to be relaxed. They're going to be tight. They're going to be... The, the, the situation itself uh, tends to create a little bit of anxiety. So. Tell them to take a deep breath, close their eyes, and relax their shoulders, and just notice how the hands hang. You can tell this first number is not. I'm going to move now. First number was two, which was uh, between my navel and my pelvic floor. Next number is six, and uh, six is just below the sternum. So just stand tall, deep breath, and relax. You'll notice my I can feel my left hand is turned in. And next number is three. Left hand came out a little bit, but still feels turned in. Three is just below the navel, so I'm, that's a low core number. Six is a mid core, and two is also a lower core. So I'm going to go to number eight now. Eight is just between the sternum, my sternum and my neck. You can see my left hand is still turned in, right shoulder still feels down. And four, left hand came in a lot more. And one, <coughs> and that feels like things started to settle out for me. Okay, it feels like my weight is actually, my hands feel like they're pretty much the same. My shoulders should be leveling out a little bit. And then I go to the next number, which is nine, and the left hand turns in again. And then I go to the next number, five. Left hand is still turned in. And seven, left hand is still turned in. <clears throat> five being the middle of the core, seven just above the sternum. Nine here at the neck. And one is the pelvic floor, and there I am again. So that's, that's one. If, if your student is relaxed, first thing I look at are the, uh, the way the hands hang. The next thing you can look at is the orientation of the hips. Now, the thing you want to remember is that your carrying angle changes by core region, <coughs> and the deflection of the hips <coughs> when I'm out of balance is going to be equal to that number. Let me show you what that means. So, at 151, my hips are going to rotate 151 degrees in a low core number. Okay, so I'm going to start at two again. You can see how much my hips rotate. This is going to be very unusual for you to see this in your students because they're not going to be relaxed, and I have an extremely wide carrying angle, power angle, uh, in my in my uh, lower core. So you can see when I relax how much my hips rotate. Now when you add this bar, you want to make sure it's flat on the hips, below the belt buckle and snug. You don't want it too tight, but you do want it snug. So I'm going to move to number six. And you can see that I still have deflection, but not as much as I had when I was in a low core number. I'm in a mid core. I'm going to go back to low core. And you can see the rotation increase once again. I'm going to go to upper core now. And you'll see that I have a very shallow power angle as a, my power angle, carrying angle, diminishes as I go from lower upper core, and you can see I still have rotation. 
<clears throat> this is actually 161 degrees, but much less than when I step to uh, a low core. I go to number four, which is just above the navel, mid core, and it flips back out. I go to one, my pelvic floor, and there it is. So that's another confirmation. <clears throat> then I go out to nine, I get a little bit of deflection. I go to five, I get a little more deflection because I'm in mid-core, and then I come back to seven, it comes back a little bit. All my rotation is left, or open. So I haven't planked today. Um, <clears throat> lastly, well, we have another way that you can test your students. Now, vision and balance are tied very closely together. Tell you what, before we go to vision, let me just say one thing. You've seen in some of the other videos the test with the ball, where um, I would get set, get in my posture, take the ball to the top. <clears throat> what you want to do is push up on the ball. I will only have strength in one of these nine regions. For me, it would be number one. After I plank, I'll have strength and all. So that's another easy way to test. Uh, Larry Rinker, one of our right balance professionals, <clears throat> Very astutely said, why do you need a ball? And you don't. You can just push up on the bottom of the hands as though they're taking the club to the top. Anytime you do these tests, you want to make sure you ask about neck, shoulder, back, uh, arm injuries. You don't want to uh, exacerbate an existing condition uh, simply by testing. <clears throat> the testing is education for not only you, but for the student. Because they're going to be, as they go through this, they're going to be quite amazed quite surprised. So another strategy is I can set up a, a line on a ball. <clears throat> this uh, piece of plexiglass on the floor here has a toothpick and a setup for the ball. So I'm going to line that up right at the toothpick, set this parallel, and I can test Every one, this look, that line on the ball, visually to me, looks like it's going left. Still going left. Now moving through the various core regions. Still going left, not quite as much there, and uh, swings a good bit left, good bit left, and there it is. All of a sudden I get to my dominant core region, and that line looks like it's going to intersect that toothpick exactly. I go to the next number. It just moved out to the right. And it went out further. Actually, it just came back to the left again and left. Now, if your students are very visual, they'll be able to see this. <clears throat> you will have some students say, I don't see any difference. Now, this is just another confirmation and an education for them about the relationship between uh, balance uh, and visual. Uh, lastly, Grab a club here, turn this around. Okay, I have one of my clubs. Now, when we talk about, if you've ever heard, you see how my hands hang exactly the same here. If I step to another low core number, like three, see how my left hand just turned in? I'll go back to one, which is my dominant. Hands hang exactly the same. I go to three, which is just below the navel, and you can see the different orientation. And I go to two, and I get even a little more internal rotation. So, I want to grip the club in a ridiculous fashion, because wherever my hand hangs is neutral. So if my hands hang like this, a very strong grip is going to look like it stays the same. You want to take the club, and you want to get under as much as you can. That would be considered an extremely weak grip. So when I push out, that club's going to stay absolutely square in my dominant core region. But if I go to two inches narrower to number four, all of a sudden that club face is turning. If I go to another, again, I want to be well under, go to another low core, and it's opening. Club face is going in. So you want to get a ridiculous grip because your grip will stay square and I'm going back to dominant, only in that dominant region. And that one out of nine stance widths, so I've got 
that's number nine, which is my neck. Here's the middle of my core, number five. And here's number seven, which is just above the start. So, <clears throat> that is, uh, that's the last way I'll show you today. So, determining the dominant core region simply gives you a road map. And if you have a student who is uh, a lower core, as I am, you want to make sure you are checking external shoulder rotation. See how much rotation I have here? And I can actually, I can seat that elbow for an under delivery. You're going to find a lot of players cannot. You're going to find that a lot of players may test for lower core. They don't have enough external rotation for that under delivery at impact. You're going to move them to mid core most likely. In the extreme cases, upper core. <clears throat> You're going to want to check. So if I go, here I am at one. There's my external shoulder rotation. If I go to nine, it's, it's like a, almost a rebound. You can see how shallow that is. If this were my low core number, and it is not, there's no way. So that's going to be more of a side cover to a side on grip. Actually, that delivery is going to be from not region nine, 161 degrees. That's all I'm getting here. But just the difference between two inches, that's my low core. Here's my upper core, and here's my mid core. My mid core is going to be a nice delivery side on. So I could play lower mid. Uh, if you have a player who has a shoulder injury, you may still want to move them down to lower core so they can use mostly body. You want to have, watch them swing the golf club. Notice where, uh, when the left arm is parallel to the ground in the downswing, where is that shaft wanting to bisect? In your beginners, it can be anywhere but in your experienced players, you're going to see it pretty quickly. And the question is, are they in a good position for their body uh, in their golf swing for injury prevention, for maximum efficiency, and the best use of the ground?